Um, we are studying through these sermons that are in, that are in Acts <clears throat> because we have this promise from Jesus when he's talking to his apostles that the, the things they're going to say are actually words from the Holy Spirit. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. So for that reason, I did not prepare today. No, I, I did. I did. For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. And so today... Uh, we're going to see another one of these. So these things that they're saying, uh, they, you know, the apostles didn't go to the Jesus school of public speaking. And in fact, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to give you the public school of public speaking. I want you, when you get into these situations, to allow me to speak through you. And in fact, that's my prayer today. Whenever I speak, God, it, these are your words. Speak your words today. We don't want to hear from just men. We want to understand your heart. And so today is another one. Today, we get the very first sermon by Paul. Woohoo! So. You're not excited, okay. Um, here's the context. Let me just show you where we're at because the context historically is really good. Remember, we had the stoning of Stephen and the persecution is continuing to happen after the stoning of Stephen. The, uh, the Jews who were so much against what Jesus was all about really get ahead of steam up and they are just, they're just arresting everybody. And uh, so as a result, um, they scatter. So the believers scatter to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch and bringing up my way cool map. Here's the way cool map. We're going to talk about Paul, Paul's first missionary journey. On the far right there, there's Phoenicia and Antioch and there's Cyprus. So the, the believers moved out of uh, Jerusalem and Israel, which is way down here off the map down here. They've been driven to the north. Uh, Antioch is a hotbed of Christian activity. The Phoenician coast, which is present-day Lebanon, has a lot of Christians in it. And believe it or not, to this very day, there's a lot of Christians who still live in Lebanon, although they're being driven out by, by uh, the Muslims. And then Cyprus over here, which is the hometown of Barnabas, we'll see in a second. So they're moving up to the north, and that's where the action starts to take place in Acts. Well, Barnabas is sent from Jerusalem uh, to see what's going on in Antioch up the north, because what's happening in Antioch is just causing great stir down in the south in Jerusalem with the few of the leaders of the Christians that are down there. So they send Barnabas to go check it out. Uh, that's in chapter 11, middle of chapter 11. And he's delighted by what he finds. He's just, he just can't believe what God is doing in that area. And so he goes looking for Saul, who, by the way, Saul came on the map back in chapter 9 in the road to Damascus. Remember that? And, and he's turned around. He tries to go preaching immediately in Damascus itself. <laughs> it didn't turn out well. <laughs> they, they put, in fact, they put a price on his head, kind of, and they want to kill him. And so he has to be let down at night in a basket over the wall of the city. The same thing that you lower your trash outside the city. Uh, later on, he'll say, you think I'm hot stuff? I'm not hot stuff. I'm so not not hot stuff that I had to be let down in a basket once. That's me. Uh, so that didn't work out well in Damascus. He decides to go south to Jerusalem and meet with the guys down there. That didn't work out really well either because he was actually proving that Jesus was the Messiah, and that got him in a lot of trouble. That's hard. So um, he's just not really well seasoned for this yet. So the believers down in Jerusalem at that point decide, you know what, we're going to send him away. So they send him away to his hometown of Tarsus. And from that point in Acts, he's been off the map until today. Until today. Now, some people like to try and guess how long Paul was out of action between Damascus and today, we'll see. And it, it's hard to figure, but it's measured in years and not weeks or months. We're talking about some, some commentators think it might actually be very close to a decade. So for a decade almost, some say maybe five or six years, but still, Paul has this experience with Christ on the road. He's completely turned around, 180 degrees, and now it's taken him close to a decade to get his head straight, but more importantly, to listen to God's teaching about this Messiah and how it's connected to the Old Testament. So today is his debut, Woo and we'll see what he's come up with after all that time. Well, so Barnabas goes looking for Saul, and he finds him, and he brings him back to Antioch. So here, Antioch's up there. And uh, that's where Barnabas is sent to find out what's going on. He goes up to Tarsus, which is right up there. That's Paul's hometown, by the way. It was really a, a center of uh, education and learning at the time. It was kind of like the Harvard and MIT of the time, but with scriptures. Goes up to Tarsus, finds Paul up there, and then drags him back to Antioch. <laughs> so so Paul's not really, Paul doesn't really have a word from the Lord like, you know, on, on July 17th in this particular year, you have to go out and start ministering. He's just cool in his heels. And then Barnabas comes into town and says, it's time to get engaged. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go back to Antioch. So he drags him back to Antioch, and Paul goes into public ministry finally. Well, you can keep reading about this in chapter 11. Saul and Barnabas minister in Antioch for an entire year, and uh, great things happen there. And then the Holy Spirit, through the leaders there, sends 
Saul and Barnabas from Antioch out to spread the word in a much larger area than just Antioch. So the Antioch church is a, is a mission-sending church. They send these guys out, they bless them, they pray for them, the Holy Spirit sends them out. And so they start up here in Antioch, where we talked about just a second ago, and from there they go on what we call Paul's first missionary journey. And they get on a boat, and they go to the island of Cyprus, they, they come into Salamis, they have some great adventures on Cyprus, they finally go up into the bottom end of Turkey, into another place called Antioch. Now that's confusing, <laughs> which is why when you read in Acts, they'll always talk about this Antioch as Syrian Antioch, because it's in Syria, and this one up here as Pisidian Antioch. So it's really just another Antioch in a different region. So he goes up there, and that's where the action begins today. By the way, look at this date right here, 46 to 48 AD. This is, this is very old. <laughs> This is, just, this is just a decade after the, the death of Jesus and the resurrection. So this is, this is very early stuff. In fact, Paul, the view of what you see Paul do here is some of the earliest things we know going on that are just very easy to document. And uh, it turns out that the, the first century church has a lot of things in it in terms of history and rulers that we can trace. This is not rocket science. You can find Pisidian Antioch. You can find Cyprus. You can find Paphos and Salamis and the Antioch that's up in Lebanon today. You can find all these places. So, and this is 48 AD. That's how well and how easy it is to, to document these things. Okay, so let's find out what happens. On the Sabbath, they're there in Pisidian Antioch, in that Antioch up there in Turkey, and they're at a synagogue, which sounds like a good starting place to have a discussion with the assembled people in town. And uh, they do the normal stuff they do, if you read in chapter 13, where they read the scriptures, and then finally they see that they have visitors, and they say, would you like to speak? And Paul says, <clears throat> you betcha. <laughs> and that's what we have today, okay? So we're in a, don't forget the fact, we're in a synagogue. This is a Jewish synagogue, so his audience is... Jewish, and that's really important. In fact, as you watch this today, he's going to have specifically a word that's meant for Jewish ears. His word today won't work that well for Gentiles, but sort of will, but not as well. If you want to see a contrast after today, um, flip over to chapter 17. You'll see in the second journey where Paul finds himself in Athens, Greece, which is the center of Greek gods and all that kind of stuff. And his message is wholly different. So watch what it goes on today. And if you want to go home and say, well, I wonder how this compares, flip over to 17. You'll see him in Athens at the Areopagus doing something very different. So just keep in mind, when you're talking about the Lord to different people, you've got to understand their background and where they're coming from and what they're dealing with and what their starting point is. Paul's going to use a Jewish starting point today. Really important. So here we go. You ready? So Paul stood up, this is Acts 13, verse 16. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, motioning with his hand. We don't see that. So I thought, you know, we're going to be going to take a break before we get into this. We're going to do the order gesture quiz. You ready? Dun, dun, we, need, we need music to go with this. Uh, what, is that, what, is that, what does that mean when someone goes like this? They want something. They want something. <laughs> no, that first, that's a simple affirmation. You are a wonderful person. That's okay. You got that? Um, the middle one. The middle one is an emphatic declaration. Uh, 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 uh. Ah, see? That's what that is. Uh, uh. Okay? And then the far right one, that's apathy. So when someone's talking to you and they just let their hand dangle like this, they don't care what you're saying. Okay? So that's how. Oh, there's more. Wait, uh, how about this one? Shake my hand. No, that's not a secret handshake. That's an energetic appeal. That's. Please, you know, they'll appeal to you. Ah, come on, you need to come. In a sense, it sort of is take my hand is what that means. You need to join me in this thing. That's what that's all about. So when speakers use that, actually, I was taught these things when I was in a rhetoric class in college, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, negation or denial? Nay. And then the far right one is even worse. No, it's a violent repulsion. No! So if you just go like this, it's nice. But like this, it's horrible. Okay, so that's, that's what that is. And then uh, just a few more. Oh, that one on the left. What do you think? You are in big trouble. At least that's what my mom used to do. You are in big trouble. I didn't even remember what she said, but I remembered yeah. this. You know, your ears kind of go deaf, and all of a sudden you think, oh, no, no. Okay, well, or, or it can mean just a cautioning. So when a, when a speaker is talking about something, he comes to a point to caution you, he'll do this, and you'll know to wake up, okay? The middle one, uh, that's a determination, a determination, or anger, one of the two. So I, I, there was a pastor that I used to be in his church, and when he would make his points, really serious points, he'd go, Mm, like this. And then at the end of this, this is determination, not anger. His determination. He'd go, mmm. And then he'd go like this. He's giving it to you. Yeah. It's kind of cool. So I remember him doing that all. 
That's kind of cool. And this one over here, that's a supplication. That's a please, please, okay? Uh, and I think I got two more. So we got to get your vocabulary set. Ah, so that one on the left, that's a gentle entreaty, okay? So you might want to consider, that's a gentle entreaty, okay? And then this one in the middle here, that's carelessness. You know, that's like, what are you doing? I don't use that one because that doesn't mean much to us anymore. The far right one, that's argumentative. If someone's talked to you and you say, well, this is this, but, they'll do this. They actually use two hands, okay? Da, 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 da. Uh, let's see, how about this one? Oh, what do you think that left one is? You know this one. Noise. Making noises? <laughs> that's a junior high thing. <laughs> hey, want to see what kind of noises I can make with my hands? No, that's not. That, that's an earnest entreaty. So we had the other kind of the gentle entreaty. This is the earnest entreaty, you know. So I beg you, beg, uh, beg you. Okay, that's what that is. And then this one right here, I like, that's resignation. Okay, don't listen to me if you don't want to. I don't care. That's what that is. All right? Now, you're going to need this because I'm going to put up hand signals as we go through Paul's speech. <laughs> what I think he did as we go along, I realize this will be a little bit of a distraction, but we're pretty much just going to read through what he says, and then after the two sections of it, we'll just take a look at it. So, so here we go. This is my guess about how Paul used his hands as he motioned with his hands. So here he goes. He stood up, stood up, motions with his hand, and he says, Men of Israel... And you who fear God. So by the way, his, his audience is Jews, men of Israel. And you who fear God could mean Gentiles, but probably not because he's in a synagogue. So when he says men who fear God, those who fear God, it's probably not uber Jews, but maybe proselytes, maybe you know, local people who became, eh, kind of hard to say. But anyway, people who fear God. Listen, okay, listen up. Here we go. And remember, this is the, this is the, oh, okay. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. Remember, they went to Egypt and eventually were in captivity there. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. You know, okay, I remember that. So Paul's going to review Jewish history because his audience is Jewish. He's got to make a connection to Jesus. So this is how he starts. And then, and then for a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the the wilderness. So that fist right there is actually an anger fist. That's not... (laughs) He put up with them in the wilderness. And if you read about the wilderness extent, God's very patient with these guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, But when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, this is he's making a way to move into the promised land, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. So the captivity and moving into Israel, that's a 450 roughly time period. And then as we go to 20, verse 20, and after these things, he gave them judges. After the come of the land, they gave them judges uh, uh, until same. Do you remember some of the judges? We talked about some before. Judges? 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 Deborah. Deborah was a judge. We did her at Mother's Day. Samson was a judge. Gideon was a judge. So all these names that you know about in the Old Testament for a nation of Israel, this is before they had kings. And these people were raised up by God kind of naturally in order to uh, bring some order to the nation. So that's the judges. So he says he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet, uh, and then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. Uh, But after he had removed him, so Saul didn't work out too well, after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom He also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. So it's an interesting contrast right here. So they asked for a king. And if you go back in 1 Samuel, you'll see them saying, you know, we're tired of this God is king kind of thing. We want a real guy, a real guy on a white horse that, you know, when he goes into different countries, people say, well, there's a king and we can can go behind him. Samuel the prophet gets very mad and says, wait a second, God's your king. And, And Samuel really gets... Picked. Go read 1 Samuel, because the people ask for, we want a real king, and they've got God as king. Well, so God gives them the king they choose. They say, hey, he's a good-looking guy, <laughs> and Saul was a good-looking guy. And so God says, okay, let's see how this goes. It did not go well, uh, but they're choosing. And then God decides, instead of asking them to nominate someone else, he says, I'm going to give you someone now, and let me show you my kind of king. And so he chooses David, even while he's a boy. He chooses David. And the distinctiveness about David as compared to Saul, the distinctiveness of David isn't that he's tall and handsome and good-looking. His distinctiveness is, what's Paul say here? Man after his own heart. heart. So God was the one who was king of Israel. Now God puts in place a king 
whose heart is like God's himself. That was always the best solution for a king for Israel. This someone who is God, and now as a second place, someone who, whose heart is like God. So, so Paul's going on. Uh, you know, we worked our way all the way up to David, who was, by the way, David was highly, highly respected in the Jewish community. Highly. I mean, he was just a big deal. So he goes on. So from the descendants of this man, talking about David, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. Now, after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So John got him ready for the fact that repentance was a necessary step for Israel. Verse 25, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. So Jesus is this very special one who was sent that John the Baptist himself says, I'm not worthy. So we are now halfway through the sermon. So let's review what he said so far, okay? And by the way, the hand signals were kind of confusing, right? Don't worry about it. So here we go. Here's what he said so far. This is my summary. Okay, so God saved our fathers from Egypt, exactly. God had patience with our fathers for 40 years, exactly. Uh, God gave our fathers the inheritance of the land, you know, the promised land, and he did that by driving out the people that were, that were sitting there. Yeah, okay. God gave them the king of their choosing, right? That's King Saul. And God gave them the king after God's own heart. Okay, yeah, we like David, good guy. And God has now given a savior in David's family, the Messiah. So that's what he said. He's just done history. But he just did a very tricky thing. Instead of saying he's given the Messiah which is what they would expect to hear. He said, they've given him Jesus. Now they were with him. They were with him all the way up until he assigned Jesus as the special one of David. When he said, when he said that, it was like, you know when you hear that, that sound of a needle going across the record? Right? That's what happened when they heard that. Because all the way through this, they're saying, right, Egypt, Right, judges, yeah, kings, Saul, right, yeah, promised land, right, right, ooh, yeah, 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 great kings, yeah, David, yeah, 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 right, great, Messiah, Jesus, ah! and they stopped in their tracks because no one in that area had ever talked about Jesus as being the Messiah. So he deliberately, uh, without them expecting it, has them hook, line, and sinker until he says, Savior Jesus, and suddenly everything goes off the rails. Now, let me describe something. I'm going to come back to uh, something we did in Galatians. But this all right here, all of this right here, is part of the promise that, that God gave to Abraham, right? About this, and we talked about this a while back, that God said, Here's, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and I'm going to give you all this land around here, and, uh, and you're going to have a wonderful nation, and I'm going to be in the center of your nation. It's going to be a wonderful thing. And God actually names the land. So, so these Jews that are listening are saying, yes, this is the promise that was made to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then all their children who would come after this. This is, this is the promise. So they hear Saul saying these things. Actually, he's now Paul, by the way. This chapter 13 is where he changes being called Saul to being called Paul, right here. So they say, well, what about the Messiah? Are, are you saying that Jesus is the Messiah? I mean, all the rest of this is classic Jewish promise being fulfilled. Let me show you a picture that we did some time back. Here's their concept of the promise. You start with Abraham, uh, not an actual photograph. Okay, you start with Abraham, and there's a promise that's given to Abraham that is given in such a way that God says this will bless you and your descendants and the entire world. So this promise continues on, and it comes to a completion in this thing, this inheritance we call it. It's like an inheritance that's passed down from, you know, through families and stuff like that because the promise starts with Abraham and eventually the inheritance is given down here in, through time, right? So, so this is the promise. This is what they're thinking. Father Abraham had a promise to him which came to the nation of Israel because Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob became Israel. Israel had 12 sons. That's us. We inherit the, the promise of Abraham. That's good. That's good. Now, when they thought about this inheritance, uh, they realized that this only works because God says, you shall be my people and I shall be your God. That, by the way, is the covenant of the entire Bible. If you'll be my people, I'll be your God. If you won't be my people, I'm not going to be your God. I'm not going to force myself on you. That really, in the New Testament wording, is like being born again. If you'll be my people, I'll be your God. So he's, this is the contract. And this, so what they're expecting in this promise, they'll say, well, are you my people? Well, of course we are. We're Jews. 
we have Abraham's blood flowing in us. Who would say that we're not children? We're not the people of God. Well, of course we are, because we have the same corpuscles that Abraham said. So really, they relied upon their ancestry to prove that they're the people of God. And is, is God their God? Well, yeah, we've proven all these things he did. He got them out of Egypt. He did all this stuff. He kept them you know, through the wilderness. He gave them the land. He drove out the people. I mean, he does, does great stuff. So yeah, okay. So the, for the Jews, they're listening to him. The promise is almost fulfilled, almost. Because when they think about the inheritance, they're thinking about a sovereign land they can live in and a supremely powerful king. Like David, plus, Right? So you have David, who was, who was a good king, even though he was a man and had faults, and he did horrible things in his life, but he, he repented, he came to God. Uh, you, you can read all about it in First and Second Samuel and then through the Psalms. But they're thinking, when, when Paul is reciting the promise, they're thinking the promise is largely a land, which is Israel, the promised land, and it's largely a king like David, but who's uber king. So what they were thinking was God has promised us as a people, now he's gotten us out of Egypt, he's promised us a place to live and a king that can never be beaten. Well, they've got the place to live, but they don't have the king who can't be beaten yet. So when they get to the time of Jesus and the time of Paul talking right here, there's one thing left to fulfill the promise in their thinking, and that is the big king, the super, super duper king. And that's what I think some of them are hoping he's going to proclaim. But he just called Jesus a savior and not a messiah. A savior? A a savior? And isn't he supposed to say, David, kings, Solomon, blah, 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 us, Israel, messiah, messiah. That's what you're supposed to say. No, he says savior, Jesus. So he's really, he got them right up to the edge and did that to them. So they're thinking this. It's almost fulfilled. So sovereign land, check. Supremely powerful king, not check. That's what they're waiting for. So when Jesus comes on the scene in the first century, that's the status of the promise in their minds. We are the people of God because we are genetically related to Abraham, whom the promise was given to. So we are in just because we have the blood. We have the land, even though we got these Romans here. But when we get our super king, he'll push them out and everyone else out and we'll be unbeatable and we'll be the best in the entire world. Ha, 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 ha. And that's the Jewish mindset when Jesus comes. They didn't realize that what they didn't need was a political military king. What they needed was a savior king. And why? Well, we'll look at that in just a second here. Because they were no longer his people. What? What do you mean they're no longer his people? Of course, we have the blood of Abraham blowing in our veins. No, they they were not his people. Even Paul goes on in the New Testament in many places and says, you want to talk about the real sons of Abraham? The real sons of Abraham has nothing to do with blood has everything to do with faith. Because Father Abraham was considered righteous by God because of his faith. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. So if you want to have children of Abraham, real children of Abraham, real people who are descendants of Abraham, they're the ones who operate by faith with God. They're the ones. And Paul Paul constructs all of Romans on just that little idea. And then through all the entire New Testament, it comes out over and over again. So there's the problem right there. They're presuming they're getting the inheritance because they got the blood, And all they need now is a supremely powerful king, but they're no longer the people. So they're stuck. So this is where he goes on right here. He he takes them to that point where they're confused about the Messiah. And he goes on the second half in verse 26. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family. See, he's kind of rubbing their face. It's more like thinking you're sons of Abraham's family, but you're sort of in that promise, right? Sons of Abraham's family. And those among you who fear God, To us, the message of this salvation has been sent. No, 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 no. We don't want salvation. We want a Messiah. Okay? Because we're okay. Who needs saving? We're okay. We're Abraham's. See? Paul's got to get to them and understand they're no longer Abraham's children because of their disobedience. So what's this message? Well, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him, Jesus, nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they fulfilled these by condemning him. Now, now he's going to get personal. <laughs> he says, you know, those who were in Jerusalem at the time when Jesus was crucified, and the rulers, that's the religious rulers, they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize who Jesus was. Nor did they recognize the utterances of the prophets which talked about him coming. And by the way, they read those passages every stinking Sabbath. And they still missed him. It's exactly what he's saying. They read them every week but they missed him. 
all together. Yeah, true. Oh, he's a he's well schooled. He knows what he's talking about. Yeah, and I think he's I think you know his credibility, but also he's speaking a little bit firsthand right here. As a Pharisee, he read he read these scriptures every Sabbath, and he didn't recognize Jesus. In fact, he was he was collecting people to kill and put in prison who followed Jesus because he was convinced that Jesus was an imposter, and he blasphemously said he was the Son of God, and he was not. So, so Paul's irony right here, he's not, he's not saying anything, he's not applying to himself right here. These guys read these passages every week, and yet when the king of kings came, they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize him. Not only did they not recognize him, they condemned him. And not only did they condemn him, but they fulfilled the very prophecies of someone condemning the Messiah that they were reading every week. The irony is just thick right here. I think right after this point, the whole crowd kind of went, oh, what? You know? So, uh, oh, it's, just, it's hard to... I, I read this and I'm staggered. So he was, you know, he, was, he was very gentle in the first half of this, and now it's like, in your face. Do we use that? Oh, in your face. <laughs> yeah. He's going to rub it in a little bit. He goes to verse 28. And though they found no ground for putting him to death... There was nothing illegally did. They asked Pilate that he be executed. They asked, they asked a Roman Gentile leader to execute him. Verse 29, and when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. So there he says it again in 29. Everything that was written about the suffering of this Messiah, they did to him. <laughs> These guys who should know better. These guys who should know the scriptures good enough. Do you remember those couple times Jesus confronts different religious leaders, and says, don't you read the scriptures? Don't you read the scriptures? And yet I think in this phase of the Pharisees in the Jewish life, there is a profound blindness that comes over them. And this blindness comes from a, from a kind of a racial supremacy that they think they're just, you know, they're hot stuff, and they, they just miss all this. And they're so focused on having the land, and now we need the uber king leader of everybody. That's all we're waiting for. So we really have no other problems, and they miss everything else about this Messiah who would actually come and suffer couldn't hear it. Their expectations were different than what the scriptures were trying to reveal. And God constantly tells us, my ways are not your ways. My wisdom is not your wisdom. You got to read this stuff. But there's blindness caused them to, to miss it altogether. They'd carried out everything that was written concerning him. Well, they laid him in a tomb and they killed this Messiah. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. That's the, the apostles, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. So he says, this, this Jesus raised from the dead, a supernatural claim that many of us have seen. And he goes on in verse 32, with his gentle entreaty, that's the gentle entreaty. So we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the Father. Now you hear a small needle go across right here. Wait, the promise to the fathers was the land and the king. But what do you mean? This guy who you're claiming is some Messiah guy, you're saying that he was killed and he raised from the dead and that's part of the promise? I don't think so. So, so right here, their heads are twisting. That's not part of the classic promise. But that is the promise made to the fathers. In fact, when he says that, he's, he's actually implying all the way back to Abraham. The promise that, was, that God made to Abraham seems to go far beyond just a land and a super king. In fact, it actually encompasses this, this king who suffered and died and raised it from the dead. That's part of the promise implicitly. And in fact, if you read through Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says this many times. He says, you know, Abraham, Abraham did some amazing things by faith. He followed God's word. He, he, he said, okay, God, I'm going to go with you on all this. But in the end, especially through chapter 11, 12, and 13, he says all these guys of faith like Abraham, you know, they never received the promise. That's what's at the end of chapter 11. They never received the promise. Well, what do you mean? They're in the promised land. But that's not the fulfillment of the promise. That's half the promise. That was part of it. That's just half of it. And in the very end of chapter 13 of Hebrews, one of my favorite verses, I forget the number, I think it's 14 or 15, but he says, here we don't have a city that'll last. So we look for the city which is to come. So these guys all understood 
that the promises of God, although they started to apply now, they really are fulfilled later in, in a much bigger sense. So that's what he's getting at. This is the good news, and that's the word evangel, where we get evangelism. That's the good news to the fathers. This is the fulfilled promise, and you're missing it. What is it? 33. That God has fulfilled this promise to our children, or to us, his children, to our children, in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written on the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So not only is the promise given, but in Jesus the promise is fulfilled. It's finished. Yeah. Turn the heart, hearts of children to the Father. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. No, that's not genealogy. But, but yeah, in Christ, we finally have the fulfillment of the promise that started in Abraham, in Christ. And, and then through Christ, blessings to all the nations. So it's not even just a racial Israel thing anymore. It's, it's bigger than that. So, so that's what he's getting. He's, he's really blowing their minds. God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus. And he says, today you're my son, today I've begotten you. By the way, that, that line right there comes from Psalm 2, which is probably one of the most non-disputed messianic psalms in the entirety of psalms. Psalm 2 is, you've got to read Psalm 2. It's just an astonishing thing because basically it starts out with God saying, ah, oh, the leaders of the world think they're such hot stuff. This is the Jim translation. They think they're such hot stuff that they're in charge of so much power and might, but I have my son. And they better wake up and realize that if they, if they, if they go up against my son, they're going to they're going to lose. And that's what the entire psalm is about, about this mighty and powerful. So, so this very one who they're saying, they're waiting for the uber super king to come, that's their idea, is the Psalm 2 idea, which is nothing wrong with. There's no one who's going to be able to oppose this king, this king of kings and this lord of all lords. No one's going to be able to oppose him. Read Psalm 2, and there he is. And so he quotes Psalm 2. This is my son. And he's connecting that uber military king to Jesus right here. That's blowing their mind again, because they're thinking, wait, we heard rumors about this Jesus. He didn't mount an army. He didn't do anything powerful. In fact, he was so powerless, they killed him. That doesn't make any sense. But Paul right here is saying, but he is the Psalm 2 King of Kings, who every leader on earth will shudder at his power and his justice and his authority. That's the same guy. That's why this is new to them. Verse 34, as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no longer to return to decay, well, he's spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, which I think, you have to check me on that. I think that comes out of Isaiah. I've forgotten right now. I should write these things down so even I remember. But what he's saying, you know, what's, he, what's he referring to? Now, this is a very Jewish thought, so he's appealing to the Jewish mind. To the Jewish mind, this, this one like David would be unable to be killed. And in fact, the legend kind of grew backwards that David himself was somehow preserved at death, that David never underwent decay. Now, how do we know this is what they're thinking? Well, because Jesus has the same argument with the Pharisees. <laughs> it's incredible. You just look in the earlier Gospels, he talks about it. He says, no, you know, this thing about not undergoing decay, that doesn't apply to David. That doesn't apply to David. And he's going to make the same point here. It applies to someone else from David. That's what it's all about. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. And that's what we're thinking about, this, this life that does not decay. 35, so therefore he also says in another psalm, he will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. Okay, so what are you getting at? Well, David, verse 36, David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep, was laid among his fathers, and underwent decay. He stinketh. He's worm meat. So clearly, you know, David died. And so all these things about this king who would never undergo decay, which actually is post-death, okay? Don't miss this part. It's post-death. So how can this king not undergo decay, but yet still he can be killed? Does that make any sense to anybody? If you won't undergo decay, then why would you die? Unless it was voluntary. Ah, these are all built into the scriptures. So here's this one who would not undergo decay, and it was not David, Paul's saying right here. It's exactly the argument Jesus has in the, with the Pharisees. It was not David. You can tell. And, and in fact, Jesus quotes another, another passage, another psalm where he says, my Lord said, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So we got two lords going on or something. So said, we're not talking about David right here, very clearly. 
And I, before we pass this on, I want you to look at this, this line because this is a, an astonishing thing. If you are worried about the very day that you're going to die, you've got to understand that you won't die any sooner than God's done with his purposes with you here. When everything's tied up and God says, that's enough, I've got everything accomplished through you I want to accomplish, he'll say, come on home, you're back. Because I, I love the phrasing right here. David, after he had served the purpose of God in his generation, fell asleep. He died. Okay. So for you and I as well, God's got plans for us to glorify himself in this generation. And he's called you to do that here. And until that's complete, you're indestructible. You cannot die. But when you finish the list, you're out of here, which for me is good news because <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go. But God's saying, yeah, we're not quite done yet. We're not quite done. Not quite done. Anyway, he's making this case that David was not the one talked about in these Psalms. Verse 37, but he whom God raised did not undergo decay. And how do we know that? Because we saw him walking around afterwards. Tomb was empty. Jesus resurrected. He appears to so many people. Paul says at one time, 500. He says, touch my body here, Thomas. I know I want you to be believing here. Feel this right here. So, I mean, he didn't undergo decay. He didn't get all wormy. Neither did, uh, did uh, Lazarus, you know, even though his sister said, well, you know, Jesus, he's got a smell right now. Jesus says, well, let's bring him in anyway. And he hadn't gone. So anyway, here's this life. This, he whom God raised did not undergo decay. That's who the Psalms are talking about. This Jesus is the one we're talking about, not David. Not David. Get off your David kick. And then with the firm entreaty, and this is firm, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. I, I don't need that. I want a king. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I've got my land. I've got the tribe that was given land. You know, when Joshua came in here, everywhere fat, dumb, and happy. Everything's fine. Give me the king. Kick out the Romans. Make us the uber best people in the entire world, and I'll be satisfied. I don't need forgiveness of sins. I don't have any sins. Really which is why John the Baptist had to come. John the Baptist went around cluing people into the fact that you have a problem, and your problem is sin. You need a Savior. Repent, the kingdom of God is near, which means judgment is close. The king's coming back. He's just been on a short trip, and he's coming back. He's the one whose thongs of his sandals I'm not even fit to untie. Can't do it. You need salvation, and it's through Christ that that forgiveness comes. And There's no other way. It's proclaimed to you, 39, and through him, through Christ, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Now, there's a pithy statement. <laughs> Isn't that a great statement? After we just spent so many weeks on Galatians, that's Galatians right there. The law has no power to free you from the sin that plagues you. It plagues you. And even if you seem to have corralled your actions on the outside and you don't kill people, you're still hating. And even though you're not actually going and committing adultery, you're still lusting and all these things. The inside is what needs to be fixed. You know, who will send the, the, the hill of the Lord but he who has clean hands and a pure heart? Okay, a pure heart. So that, that's the problem. Through him, everyone who believes is freed from everything that the law just couldn't free you from. The law was given very clearly through the New Testament. The law was given to reveal the breadth of our sin, to show how far, how far we fall short. But the law wasn't given so you can say, okay, I'll make a list and do it, and I'll fix myself. Can't do it. You can't free yourself from that. That's part of what we've inherited from Adam as a race. It's this propensity to sin that regardless of our willpower, we just can't stop sinning. Now, if you think you can go back and inventory the status of your heart on a weekly basis because God will judge the secret intents of the heart as well as the actions, really, but he'll see that as well. That's the problem, and that's what makes you disqualified, dear Jews, for not being Abraham's children. You're rebellious to God. God obeyed, God called Abraham, and he, and he responded out of faith. And God, he believed God, and he had that faith in God, and that was counted to him as righteousness because he believed that. But you all are acting like some kind of spoiled kids, thinking you've got it all and it's all going to come to you, but actually in your heart, you're no longer Abraham's children. You've lost it. You need salvation, and it's only through him, through this Jesus. Forget about the law of Moses. It's not going to save you. 
So therefore, take heed. It's a good finger. Take heed so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. And here's where Paul's understanding of the Old Testament can be pretty biting. <laughs> what do we quote to make them kind of tremble in their shoes? Just a, just, a, you know, just a little bit to put an edge on this. You know, what do we go? Ah, this is what we quote. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel, and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it. And by implication, like I am right now, Paul, to you guys. Don't be scoffers, because God's predicted your kind would exist. Don't fulfill this scripture right here. I'm warning you, don't do this. Don't do this. Behold, you scarf, scoffers, marvel, pair. I'm accomplishing a work in your days, a work, a work which you'll never believe. You'll never believe, even though someone should describe it to you. Ugh. So let's review the last half of Paul's message because that's where he leaves it. He says, basically, God has sent us with this word of salvation. We have this word of salvation, which they don't think they need, but they do need it, this word of salvation. And the word of salvation is this. The Savior was condemned by religious leaders down in Jerusalem. The Savior was killed by Gentiles being maneuvered by the religious leaders. The Savior was raised from the dead. And believe it or not, all of these things are the promise fulfilled. That stuff was all predicted. In the Old Testament. So, Jesus, so Paul isn't saying these are all accidents that we're kind of trying to splice in to the Abrahamic promise. No, this has always been there. You guys read it every Sabbath and you missed it. And there it is, the promise fulfilled. So the Savior fulfilled the promise from God. He is the fulfillment of that, process, of that promise. So belief in this Savior brings forgiveness of sin and freedom from the law's condemnation for anybody. For anybody, which means not just Jews, but for anyone who believes. For anyone who believes. So he's talking about the Jews right there and probably their, their proselytes who came from non-Jewish racial blood sitting in their midst. He says, this works for everybody. But you know what? You would think that it's necessary for the proselytes, the people with Galatian blood and stuff like that, but you Jews need it as well. You, you have no edge on anybody else. This is what you need. And you need this salvation. Well, let me, let me tell you what Paul's trying to do. This was the concept of the Jewish promise, ending with land and a super king. You'll be my people genetically. We got that. I'll be your God. Yeah, all sewed up. But actually, the inheritance and the promise goes far beyond that. In fact, it extends past that, and it comes to even a bigger inheritance, where it's the kingdom of God, with God as king. That was always, in fact, the promise that was made to Abraham. Here's this tribe of people that I want to call to myself. This, this is what we call this tribe of people, these new people who say, we want in on the kingdom of God. We want God to be the center of our lives and the center of our community and the center of everything that we are and we have. We want God to be in the middle of everything. We want to come to love him and understand, like Paul says in Ephesians 3, the length, breadth, width, and depth of his love. We want that God and we want community with that God. We want that community and we want him as king. And that was God's intention for Israel all along. That's why Samuel got so ticked when they said, give us a king. And Samuel says, you have a king. His name is Yahweh. It's your problem. But this has always been the intention. The first inheritance, what we just saw, that's, there's a thing in the Bible called dualisms. And that really was part of the promise, the land in physical Israel. That was part of the promise. And the promise to make a society, a tribe, a community with God as its center. That was always the idea. And, and that was, yeah, that was like the model home. That, that was the way in which they could live. And other nations would look in and say, hey, that looks pretty cool. I want your God, and I want to be part of that tribe. But the plan was going to go far bigger than just the physical nation of Israel. It was going to be, read through the end of Revelation, you know, after even we all die. That's the plan. So Israel was meant to be kind of a model to show and to showcase to the entire world what God's offer was. But for this to work, you've got to be his people and he'll be, his, he'll be your God. But if you don't want to be his people, and you want yourself to be your own God and the king of the universe, all bets are off. It doesn't work. And that's the promise. So here's this new promise. Now, how is it that you solve the problem that you're not God's people, either for the Jews or for us Gentiles? Well, along comes the cross that erases our disqualification because of our sin, and now anyone 
who believes that Jesus is this one, and Jesus is this one who died because of our tragic sins, he says, you're in. He paid the price for all of us. I quoted this last week. There's this verse that sometimes God gives me and it just won't go way out of my head. This one in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, you know, and he says, he says he died for all so that those who live might live for him. Not, might, might live not for themselves, but for him who died and rose on his behalf. Yeah. Because we're convinced that one died for all. Therefore, we all, in a sense, have died. The price has been paid for our sins. It's done. We are now... God's people, through what Christ did on our behalf. And we can participate in that. By the way, this half of the picture is what we commonly refer to as the new covenant. It's this idea that there's, the promise is fulfilled in a much larger sense on a cosmic universal scale through the blood of Christ. And so the thing that preceded this, where the promise stops in just the promised land, is the old covenant. So that, I mean, that's the simple dis- differentiation. There's a lot more subtleties to it, but that's largely it. So when you see the first half of the Bible is called the Old Testament and the second half is called the New Testament, testament is exactly the same word as covenant. So when they first separated this, they said, this is the Old Covenant and this is the New Covenant. And that's largely right. However, you can find fingerprints of the New Covenant all through the Old Covenant because it's everywhere back there. Because Abraham got it and so did many others. There's, there's more that's coming beyond this. And this, this is just not the end with this promised land. Okay, so let me tell you the outcome, and we'll kind of finish up. So how did it all turn out? Well, it turned out they begged him to speak again the next Sabbath. <laughs> they didn't stone him, which, you know, he was like, he was, he, was, he was there. He should have offended them, at least some of them. And in fact, indeed, he did offend some. But at the end of the sermon, basically, at this, they said, you know what? You have got to come back next Sabbath. Man, we got to hear more about this. We are intrigued about this Jesus who's a Savior he, and maybe the Messiah. And, and you're saying the promises are fulfilled? Come, why don't you come on back next week? That's what we want to do. Well, the next Sabbath, <laughs> it says the entire city shows up. <laughs> I mean, after that Sabbath, they went around town and said, you should have heard what we heard this morning. You got, he's coming back next Sunday. He's going to tell us everything. And they go, okay, we're there. And so all of Antioch and Pisidia show up the next morning. The entire town, every, everyone shows up. They're there. It's incredible. You know, I mean, read verse 44. It's just kind of a funny thing. But the ruling Jews in town were really jealous. And what were they jealous of? The size of the crowds. <sighs> They've got more people following Paul than they have following us. That's just not right. We've got to take control here. We've got to get back in place. You know, the motivations for them in all this is pride and ego and power and control. It has nothing to do with the Messiah Jesus at all. I mean, if anything, they should be as intrigued as anybody. But they're sensing their power base is shifting. And it should, because when Jesus comes by faith into a community, the power base ought to shift to Jesus and away from those men. And they sense it going. And so they, they, want, to get, they want to get involved. So the next time Paul talks, all they can do is interrupt him and argue and slander him. They call him names. That's called ad hominem arguments. And say that Paul's blaspheming. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, Paul and Barnabas, they they speak out even more boldly, even in the midst of this catcalling that's going on through the entire thing. And then Paul and Barnabas turn from the Jews to the Gentiles. I'm going to read this section that actually where this happens. Verse 46, and we'll close on this. So Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, boldly amidst all that stuff. And they said, You know, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. We're talking Jews. To you first. Since you repudiate it and you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning the Gentiles. All the air kind of gets sucked out of the room. Since you repudiate what I've told you and you judge yourselves, you judge yourselves unworthy for eternal life. That's just... Man, this is pithy stuff. Since you don't want it and you don't think you're worthy of it, well, then we're going to turn to the Gentiles. Well, that's the worst thing he could have said to a Jewish ear because the Jews were God's people. And he's saying, I'm going to take the fulfilled promise of Abraham and turn it to the Gentiles. No, you can't do that. It was only for Abraham's children. So you're not getting it. You're not getting it. It's the ultimate insult. You Jews, the people of promise have refused the very thing. You judge yourselves unworthy, so I'm turning to the people who you have always called in your entire existence dogs. I'm turning to the dogs. Yeah, she does. Yeah, the parable of the wedding. 
It's exactly the same thing. And Jesus tells the same thing over and over and over, that here's his promise to these people, and they reject it, and they go, he goes over here instead. In fact, I'm going to stop right here just for a second. Well, let me just do this. Um, I've, he quotes from the Old Testament, I've placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth, not just Israel. Okay. And that's where Paul will spend most of his time from here on through the rest of Acts. But I, I want to take just a quick detour right here, just a quick ex-Mormon moment. If you happen to be ex-Mormon, you're really familiar with this, this phrase in John 10 where Jesus says, I have sheep from another fold, other sheep I have. They're not of this fold. And many times that's extended to mean, well, he starts with the people in Israel, and now this means from a Mormon idea, it extends to the people in the Americas, the Nephites and the Lamanites. Um, but that's, that's not it. I mean, it's very easy to show that what Jesus is referring to is the Jews and the Gentiles. And you see that switch happening right here. Now, if you think it's just this verse, there's other places. There's Matthew 10. Yeah, Matthew 10, where Jesus sends out the apostles and when he sends out the apostles to go visit these different, you know, little bergs around the area, he says, if you go to a Gentile or a Samaritan town, don't go there. I'm sending you to, get ready, the lost sheep of Israel. But don't go to the Gentiles. And that's what they do. Another place, another place. You go up to the present-day Lebanese coast, and you go in Matthew 15, Matthew 15, and he meets a woman up there. We call her Syrophoenician. She's Canaanite. She's from the Gentiles that preceded the Jews coming to the land. She's up there and she appeals to Jesus to heal her daughter from demon possession. And Jesus, in a really cagey interview, which is one of my favorite, favorite vignettes in the entire New Testament, he says to her, but wait a second, I can't do this for you because I am sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And yet she's a Canaanite Gentile. And in the end, he does heal her daughter because she understands that it's kind of a sequence of order. It's the Jews first and then it's the Gentiles. She, she somehow understood that. That's why Jesus turns around and says, this is the biggest faith I've ever seen in Israel to a Canaanite woman. That's why I love it. You've got to read it. It's in Matthew 15. So very clearly in many places, there are two folds of sheep. There's the lost sheep of Israel, and then there's the Gentiles. You see it over and over. That's the contrast, back and forth. And here it is again, Paul, the uber-trained uh, academic Jew from Tarsus, who says, I'm going to take this promise of Abraham and Turn it to the Gentiles. Yeah. Like a parent with two kids? And, yeah. And one, well, I, want, I don't want that. So I'm going to give it to this one. Then all of a sudden, that. So this one doesn't want ice cream. I'll give it to your, your brother. Whoa, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much what it is. It's the grace of God. It's this free gift. It's this salvation and this forgiveness through this Jesus. And you deem yourself, you judge yourself unworthy of that, then I'm going to someplace else. Yeah. Just like Jesus said back in Matthew 10 with the apostles, if you go into one of those towns where they don't receive you, you stomp the dust off your feet and find someone who will receive it. And that's exactly what he's doing right here. And then he closes with this. When the Gentiles heard this, hey, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Not just the Lord, the word of the Lord, what they're hearing. They started rejoicing in this. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region because Paul shifted and went to the Gentiles. And they were very happy, <laughs> which is why the good news is called the good news, because they would accept that. But see, here's the point. Paul found a community of Jews who felt like they didn't have a problem that needed saving. And so when someone's not convinced of the fact that they have a problem from which they need saving, then the word of salvation is useless to them. Why, why do I need to be saved? I don't have a problem. I've got the promised land. Just give me the uber king and we'll be done. No, you have a problem because you're no longer a citizen of that land. You no longer qualify for that promise. You don't and none of mankind does. And, and in fact, when you go back in the Old Testament, they should have gotten this. Some of them got it, but they should have gotten it just, just due to the fact that when Israel was established as a country, God set his temple in the middle of the country and the sole purpose of that temple was to deal with the sin of the people to deal with their rebellion against God. And over and over and over, sacrifices are made. So God's saying, this, this temple is not only a place symbolically, I want to be in your midst, although God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, but I want to symbolically be in your midst. I want to be in the center of your entire society. But you got to understand that even though I fit here, you don't because you're sinful. So we're going to have to do what we do in the temple. Just to be reminded over and over and over again that your sin brings the death of someone. Animals, 
Christ. And they should have gotten it because everything that was constructed in old Israel was meant to point them to this direction. Even the law of Moses was meant to point them in the direction of a need for Christ. Paul says the law is like a tutor. It's that pedagogos we looked at in Galatians. It's supposed to point you in neediness to someone who can fix the problem that you can't fix on your own because the law is never going to free you from the things you think the law is going to free you from. You need Christ. It points us to everything Old Testament-wise. That's where there's a new covenant in the Old Testament. It points you to the fact that Jews, you, and us Gentiles are all disqualified from this future kingdom of God with God at its center. You'll be my people, I'll be your God, but you can't because you're tragically flawed with sin. But I'll solve the problem of your sin. One died for all, therefore, in a way, all have died. It's done. It's done. And so now our response to him, our response to him, he died for all so that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose on our behalf. So by the way, if you're living a Christian life, thinking it's all about living for yourself. It's all about gleaning the list of rules that will purify yourself and make you a better person and eradicate the sins in your life, and it's actually benefiting you. You're doing this for you. Then you violate living for him. You can do the same good work, okay? You can give food to the poor on this side, give food to the poor on this side. But on this side over here, if you're giving to the poor because I think this will make me better and more holy, then you're not living for God, you're living for yourself. But on this side, if you're giving food to the poor because the love that's poured out to you from God is now pouring through you and you get nothing in return, that's not, that's not living for yourself. That's living for the one who died and rose on our behalf. We could talk so much more on that. But it's really, it's really the outcome. Are you earning something with your good works or are you just giving out of love out of your good works? That's what really dif- differentiates a good work that's good and a good work that's bad. It's not the good work itself, it's why you're doing it, that we might live for him. So Paul comes to this place and says, we're giving you this word, you have rejected it, you've rejected Jesus as being this Messiah, King, this one who brought fundamentally salvation because you've disqualified yourself from the children of Abraham. So I'm taking this promise and doing what God had always predicted in the Old Testament, and we're bringing it to the Gentiles. And from this point on in Paul's ministry throughout this part of the world, It's more Gentiles than Jews. He'll talk to Jews from time to time. But he is really the the guide to the Gentiles. Now, one last point. Why would Paul, who is such a well-trained Jew, waste his upbringing going to the Gentiles? Wouldn't it be better for Paul, who's trained as an academic uber Jew, to go to the Jews so he can argue with them out of the Old Testament like he's done, and pazing, there you go, read this verse right here, pazing, read Psalm 2, there's just zing, doom, doom, doom. That's what I do it. This is why God didn't call me when he assigned, he assigned up to, yeah. Why would Paul, who is so qualified to speak to Jews, be sent now to the Gentiles? Well, number one, the Lord commanded it. So you just go where he sends you. But in a real sense, throughout the entirety of the first century world right here, the Jews had taken such an uppity perspective about how qualified and privileged they were as being the people of God. They lost no, no opportunity to go to a Gentile and say, you're not in, but we are. <laughs> right? And God said in the Old Testament, you need to separate yourself from Gentiles. They're a, bad, they're a bad influence. They'll bring in, you know, baby sacrifices and stuff like that. You don't want to go there. So the Jews strutted around like they were really hot stuff. And the Gentile world knew this. They knew the arrogance of the Jews. They knew that they thought they were in just because they had Abraham's blood. So God, in a wonderful twist, says, I'll take one of the most respected Jews anywhere who will go as a... As a unique calling card to the Jews. And he himself will say, you're in. You're in. Welcome. Welcome to the banquet. You're in. From a Jew with credentials. I I think it's just brilliant. I think it's brilliant. And then later on, as Paul talks about, and he looks back on his ministry, he says, you know, I didn't come to you with fancy talk. That's Tarsus academic training. I didn't come to you with fancy talk, right? I could have. Got it. Hip pocket. But what I came to do was focus on what he did right here. Jesus Christ and him crucified, risen from the dead, and because of the price paid for our debts, for our sins, now if you believe he's that one, you can find salvation and you can become the people of God with all the rest of them, starting with Abraham, who started with just a profession of faith. And you're in. I think it's just a beautiful calling card that Paul himself would say, all my training is junk. 
Actually, he uses a potty mouth word for that, but it's, it's, it's junk. It doesn't, doesn't do anything. Great, great ambassador for Christ. As though we're entreating on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. And Paul is the perfect spokesman. But don't tangle with him if you're a Jew and you want to argue the Old Testament. <laughs> it almost got him killed in Damascus because he was so good at it. But he knows the scriptures. He understands that Jesus, Jesus is not an anomaly. He's, a, he's the fulfillment of the promise that started from Abraham. And here he is. And this is salvation for anyone who believes. And thank God, because that comes to us. That comes directly to us. Okay, we got to quit. It's getting hot and I'm running out of air. So let's, let's pray. Father, what a remarkable, what a remarkable sermon. Thank you for preserving this for us and thank you for reinforcing in our hearts many of the things that we've already known that Paul spoke with such boldness. We ourselves <clears throat> were amazed when you brought the message to us that if we believe in this one, this Messiah, this Jesus, who died on our behalf and rose on our behalf, that we might have life, that the price for our sins has been paid, the condemnation has been satisfied, and now we can be counted as the people of God. That, that's, that's an astonishing thing. That's an astonishing thing. So, Lord, our hearts, our hearts leap with gratitude first. But, Lord, I also think about um, the Jews who to this very day for whom this message is, is darkened, it's blackened, and those who wish they were Jews and act like they were extra Jews, even claim to be parts of certain tribes of the Jews, who somehow presume that they are in because they have some kind of racial connection, either real or imagined, and who miss, who miss the opportunity. Lord, I, I, think, I think about Jesus talking about those who will come to the table at this end of time from the north, south, and east, and west. They'll come from all corners of the globe. And yet those who call themselves the sons of Abraham will be outside and rejected. So Lord, our hearts go out to those who rely on that kind of a structure of the law the law that Paul says can't free us anyway. And we pray that you would soften our hearts toward those who still rely on this kind of thinking, who don't understand that they're in desperate need of salvation, that there is no one that's privileged, there is no one that's, that's in based on their genetics, that all we like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So thank you for that good news, and maybe we, may we be your mouths, your lips, to a hurting generation that needs the good news as good news. So thank you for this now. We, we thank you for your word. What a delight. What a pleasure. What a light. And we thank you for this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.